Good afternoon. Welcome to this lecture sponsored by First Church of Christ Scientist in Anderson, South Carolina. Its title is Christian Science, A Clearer View of You. Our speaker is Lal Young. He is a Christian science practitioner and an authorized teacher of Christian science. He's also been a member of the board of directors of the Mother Church, the First Church of Christ Scientist in Boston, Massachusetts. Lyle learned of Christian science when he was a university student through an on-campus Christian science organization. Knowing the world needed healing, wanting to be part of the solutions to the world's problems, and feeling that Christian science provided the spiritual tools to pray effectively and find answers, Lyle began taking one newspaper each week to pray about the issues described in all the articles. Very quickly, he knew that doing this only once a week wasn't enough. He began reserving first two and then three nights a week to pray for others in the world. And eventually, he left his university program to devote himself full time to helping others through prayer as a Christian science practitioner. It's a deep and broad love that motivates Lyle, a love of God, of the ideas in the Bible, and in the published writings of Mary Baker Eddy, the discoverer and founder of Christian science, and of all humanity. That love and affection for humanity expresses itself in a keen interest in cultures, languages, history, the arts, and sports. Lyle runs and swims regularly, and he rides his bike year-round. Lyle lives in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. He presents lectures on Christian science in English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Fortunately, today he will speak to us in English. Welcome, Lyle. Thank you very much, uh, Mary Beth. Um, for that gracious introduction. It gives me great joy to be able to speak to each of you. And uh, if you're in Anderson, or if you're in another part of South Carolina, if you're in another part of the United States, or if you're in another part of the world, uh, really it gives me um, a great joy to be able to speak to you in this way today. Over the next hour or so, I'm certainly going to be talking about the pandemic, but first I have to give you a bit of background. So please be patient. We will come to that important topic. Even in spite of a pandemic, life is indeed beautiful. If you think of a lifelong happy friendship or a marvelous family day with several generations around a common table or on a Zoom call, magnificent natural scenery, or a painting that captures that fleeting moment when the moonlight is playing with the surface of a lake, or a poem that in just a few words gives a profound insight. But human life is never just beautiful. I think it's safe to say that we all know human life and its challenges, its frustrations, its disappointments, its conflicts, big and small, its fears and its illnesses, including the contagious ones. Christian science presents new and fresh insights into the nature of God, new and fresh insights into the nature of who we are as children of God. These new and fresh insights can lift us above the limitations and discords of human life and help us see how we truly are as children of God, who we truly are as manifestations of the divine and how we are always happy, always well, and always at peace. Mary Baker Eddy, the discoverer of Christian science, knew human life very well. 
She grew up in the 1820s and 1830s in the part of the United States called New England, where the city of Boston is. Specifically, she was the sixth in a family of six children on a farm in New Hampshire. When she was a little girl, she loved God dearly and she delighted in her family. Because she was often sick, she couldn't attend school regularly, but she was greatly interested in learning. She was greatly interested in the world around her. She was strongly encouraged in her studies by her scholarly brother, Albert. She was strongly encouraged, especially by her mother, to put into practice the teachings of Jesus. At age 22, Mary Baker married George Glover, a builder, and together they moved to a very different part of the United States. Uh, they moved to uh, South Carolina and then settled down in North Carolina. However, after but six months, and in spite of their best prayers, he died suddenly of yellow fever. Yes, a contagious disease, leaving her alone and expecting. She returned to New Hampshire, where she lived initially with her parents and later with a sister. When her little boy was born, he was a handful. He was a wild, energetic little boy. And because she was often sick, it was challenging for her to care for him. Somewhat later, the rest of her family, um, concerned about her health and against her wishes, had the child taken away and placed in the care of another family. Of course, that broke her heart. And I think that it was one of the reasons why she wanted to marry again, to form a family circle to receive her little son. She married Daniel Patterson, an itinerant dentist. But their marriage was not a happy one. His income was never regular enough that they could enjoy much financial stability. And towards the end of the marriage, he was no longer faithful. Although she worked uh, at saving that marriage more than 20 years, finally, she divorced him. And the family with whom her little son was living moved to what was then considered to be the far west, to the state of Minnesota, where he was told that his mother had passed on. She heard nothing from him for more than five years and didn't see him again for close to 25 years. Of course, we all have challenges. How was Mary Baker facing hers? By striving even more to put into practice the teachings of Jesus? by turning even more fully to her Bible. She knew that the Bible is filled with the promise that God is always present to help us in moments of difficulty. But how to prove that practically in the middle of poverty, in the middle of loneliness and of ill, uh, and of Ill health? During this time, she explored various ways of improving her health, conventional medicine, homeopathy, a system of healing that was very popular at the time called the water cure, and what we today would call hypnotism. For a time, she used the services of a well-known mental healer, Phineas Quimby, and for a time, she seemed better, but only for a time. And ultimately, she was disappointed because the basis of his system of healing wasn't the spiritual and moral principle that was the basis of the healing works of Jesus. In 1866, she had a breakthrough. She was walking to a temperance meeting. This was a kind of meeting that was fairly common in that day, organized to try to discourage the consumption of alcohol in society in general. It was winter in the month of February in a small city called Lynn, not far from Boston. And walking to this meeting, she fell on a slippery sidewalk and became unconscious because of the fall. She was taken to a house that wasn't far from there. And the doctor who diagnosed her diagnosed serious internal injuries and didn't think that she would survive. But she came to and she asked for a Bible. Then 
in a moment of great inspiration while she was reading one of the accounts of Jesus' healings, her decades of searching for spiritual answers, her decades of searching for better health culminated in a healing. She was suddenly well to the surprise of her friends. And although she experienced minor relapses in the next few months, she was finally entirely healed, not only of the effects of the fall, but ever after that experience, she enjoyed better health than before. What had she seen? Later, she would say that during those moments of great inspiration, she saw that above everything biological, above anything organic or physical, was the reality of God as infinite life. And she was at one with this life. And in this relationship of oneness, she had everything that she would ever need, including her health. Throughout history, many people have been healed and then they've simply gone on with living their lives. But she wanted to understand how she had been healed. Why was she healed when she was healed? Why not earlier? Why not later? Could the good results be repeated in other cases with other people? Very naturally for her, she returned to her Bible and she began to take detailed notes on what she was studying. She was finding that with this understanding of God as infinite life, with this understanding of identity as being the expression of life, she could consistently heal other people. And not long after that, she began to teach other people how to heal with this understanding. The fact that not just she, but others as well could heal with this understanding confirmed for her that the capacity to heal wasn't a special capacity just for her, a special dispensation from God just for her, but that she had come to discover the science of healing that was the basis of the healing works of Jesus. These healings were significant physical healings, diphtheria, malaria, tuberculosis. But there was also a, an important moral element. Often the person healed, healed felt uplifted spiritually. Often the person became a better person, less selfish, for example. By 1875, she had organized all of her notes in the Bible into a book. So she had worked and reworked all of those notes. And this is the book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. In the book, she talks about how to experience safety during a contagion, even if in the course of one's, uh, the course of doing one's duty, one's exposed to that contagion. She also talks about how to be healed of a contagious disease. But before talking more specifically about contagion, I wanted to read two passages that are perhaps even more fundamental. First, this passage. It says here, the Christ-like understanding of scientific being and divine healing includes a perfect principle and idea, perfect God and perfect man, as the basis of thought and demonstration. She wasn't saying that humans are perfect. She was saying that beyond anything human is the perfection of God. And each of us in our true spiritual being is actually the perfect reflection of this perfect God. Here's the second passage that I wanted to read. It says here, you can prove for yourself, dear reader, the science of healing, and so ascertain if the author has given you the correct interpretation of scripture. Someone who did just that was Asa Gilbert Eddy. And in 1877, they married. And so Mary Baker, taking his surname, became Mary Baker Eddy. Speaking of demonstrating this science for oneself, I wanted to recount two personal experiences, one in the context of COVID-19, but first, an experience that I had about 15 years ago. I began to experience very sharp pains in my lower abdomen. In reality, these, 
were painful sessions, that painful episodes that lasted two or three hours. I prayed with some of these very ideas that God is my life and that I'm perfect now as the reflection of this life. During this time, I was working for the Church of Christ Scientist. And a little bit later on, I'll give you some background about the church. And in the capacity in which I was working for the church, I needed to appear to speak in public six times a week. Gratefully, these painful episodes didn't interfere with my doing that work. I was so grateful for that. They came at other times, on other days. Also, during a part of this time, I received the visit of various family members, and had they known that I was experiencing these, these pains, they would have been very concerned, but they never found out if I was with them and needed to go away to pray about this discomfort. I was able to say that I had work to do, which was not surprising. I almost always had work to do. I was so grateful that they were never concerned. In fact, these pains made me think of the experience of a family member decades before, when the family member was hospitalized and diagnosed with gallstones. Also during a part of this time, I received help from first one Christian science practitioner and later from another. And I should tell you that a Christian science practitioner is a person who gives his or her full time to helping others in prayer. The practitioners prayed with me. We talked about passages from the Bible, from science and health. They were an enormous help to me, those practitioners. I was very grateful for their aid. The painful episodes stopped after about two or three weeks. They stopped until they came back again about five months later. But this time I was very much ready to face them with a great sense of authority with a great sense of conviction of my present perfection that I simply was and am free as the reflection of God. And the pain stopped. They stopped definitively, as I say, about 15 years ago. Such a healing has as its basis a higher concept of what identity is. I mean, the basis of my prayers was that I was spiritual now as the reflection of God. Such a healing also has as its basis a higher concept of who God is. Who is God? Christian science teaches that he or she, instead of being one thing amongst many things in the universe, instead of being one entity amongst many entities in the universe, that God in reality is all. But how can that be? How can God be all if we live in a world made up of things? Mary Baker Eddy found in the scriptures a sense of God as being infinite, unopposed love, infinite, unopposed life, the only intelligence, the only mind, the only substance of the universe and that this was the basis of the teachings and healing works of Jesus. Of course, we can read in 1 John in the Bible that God is love. Also, we can read in the Gospel of Luke what has sometimes been called the pearl of parables, the parable of the prodigal son. In this parable recounted by Jesus, a father whose heart is just filled with compassion and love accepts back his youngest son who has treated him most disrespectfully and has simply gone off and wasted his inheritance. When the son realizes he has nothing left, not even anything to eat, he decides to go back to the father, but he doesn't think that the father will take him back as a son. He hopes perhaps as a servant, at least in that way, he'll have something to eat. But when the father sees him coming back, he sees him from afar, the father runs out to meet him and hugs him and kisses him and says that he wants to celebrate because, he says, this, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. 
With this parable, Jesus was indicating the nature of God as infinite, unopposed love, unconditional love for each and every one of us. What Mary Baker Eddy was seeing was truly revolutionary and was challenging the most basic assumptions of human thought itself. She wasn't seeing that there's discord and difficulties and disease, including contagious disease. And then there's also infinite love. She was seeing that infinite love is so infinite that it actually exists instead of an imperfect material creation. In other words, there isn't a human context where suffering is normal, natural, and inevitable for every one of us. And then there's also infinite love. She was seeing that infinite love is so infinite that it actually excludes the existence of anything other than this love and its expression. With this sense of God as being infinite, unopposed love, logically, we may need to rethink who exactly we are. Usually people think of themselves as being essentially physical beings who are evolving physically in a physical universe that itself is evolving physically. But the first thing that we can say is that each of us simply shines eternally as the very expression of this unopposed love. And that identity therefore is just as perfect as this love is perfect. Identity can't be diminished, it can't be oppressed. Identity can't be lost in any way. Identity can't be contaminated in any way. Here's an analogy. Think of a building with three stories, the ground floor, the second story, and the third story. Each story is going to symbolize a sense of identity. The ground floor could be seen as symbolizing a sense of identity as being exclusively physical. So the person is born physically, he or she is shaped by the genes of his parents, by his or her first experiences, later by other experiences. The person's composed of atoms and chemicals. The person lives a certain number of years. Hopefully the person loves at least a little bit and then the person is no more. That's one concept of identity. The second story you could think of as standing for a, a sense of identity that is essentially physical. So yes, the person is living physically, but in addition to that, within the body is a spirit. So eventually the body dies, but the spirit survives. Although unfortunately, nobody actually knows in what form. That's the second story. But I wanted to talk to you about the third story, a completely different sense of identity, a different concept of identity. According to this concept, we are exclusively, we're purely spiritual existing as the very expression of this infinite unopposed love. And what gives us our sense of ourselves, what makes us who we are is not how old we are or the color of our skin or um, our age. Rather, each of us is a unique expression of the infinite gamut of qualities of this love, qualities like joy, intelligence, beauty, strength. It's from this third story, sense of ourselves, that we have all good. It's because we are intelligent as manifestations of this infinite love. That's why we can show forth that intelligence by doing our jobs better, for example. It's because we are loving and strong as the very expressions of this infinite love. That's why we can show forth that love and that strength by being better parents, by being better grandparents. It's because Health and wellness is, are actually built into who we are as the expression of this love. That's why we can show forth that health in our day-to-day -day living. If we're purely spiritual, how do you explain those other two concepts, the ground floor and the second story? 
the first thing that we can say is that seen from an absolute point of view, they have no actual reality. They're simply human concepts. They're simply human beliefs. But those human concepts, those human beliefs have neither been created by this infinite unopposed love, nor could they even actually be known to this infinite love. And in fact, these human concepts, these human beliefs have no actual substance. That said, the human appearance of things, our highest collective perception of God's creation, can't help but reflect in some measure the beauty of spiritual life. So all of the beautiful things about human life, and I mentioned just a few of them at the start of this talk, are to be cherished, valued, appreciated, um, loved, not because they represent the absolute spiritual reality that Mary Baker Eddy found in the scriptures, but because even as a human perception of things, they have great value. And as we grow spiritually, all of the beautiful things about human existence become more beautiful as we see them in a more spiritual way, while all of the bad things about human existence simply fade away because we gradually see they have no actual principle sustaining them. There's nothing really holding those bad things in place. They're certainly not grounded and rooted on the rock, in the rock of this infinite love. We, on the other hand, are rooted and grounded in this infinite perfect love. And it's because we're rooted and grounded in this infinite perfect love that's why we can show forth this pure reality. That's why we can show forth our perfection. That's why, for example, we can overcome sin, overcome thoughts that aren't loving, stop actions that aren't loving. And in Christian science, overcoming sin is very important. But we overcome sin not as a part of, it, not as a part of identity, but as a lie about identity a lie about identity because identity is the reflection of this infinite unopposed love. When a dog comes out of the lake or the river, the dog shakes himself off uh, to be dry, but the water is not part of the dog. In the same way, we can shake off sin mentally because sin is not a part of who we are. Here's a passage in the Bible that says, essentially that. It's in the book of Ephesians, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. It says here, you were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The person who showed forth at best this true righteousness and holiness was Jesus. When you read the Gospels, it seems as if Jesus is always feeling his oneness with God. And I think you can see he was always searching, he was always striving to know what the will of God was and to do that will of God. I think it was for that reason that he was unafraid to reach out and touch the leprous man and to bring healing to him, even as he brought healing to so many others. And not only did Jesus bring healing, he also brought reform. And he brought reform to people by seeing them in the light of this infinite, unopposed love. It was Jesus showing forth the Christ, the true idea of God as infinite love that allowed him to heal, that allowed him to bring reform to people. But the Christ, the true idea of infinite love, existed before Jesus, and Jesus embodied perfectly the Christ. But the Christ is with each of us, where we are right now and always. It's the Christ that strengthens us and that consoles us. It's the Christ that um, encourages us 
It's the Christ that awakens us to our true spiritual nature. It's the Christ that heals us. That was the experience of a friend of mine. The year was 1984 and she was in the hospital. She had just undergone an operation and the doctors had had to explain to her that they had found various tumors in her lower abdomen. The doctors hardly knew what to recommend in terms of treatment. They thought perhaps an exploratory operation and then maybe chemotherapy, but frankly, they didn't hold out much hope that she would be living much longer. So she was in the hospital, but she wasn't receiving any medical treatment. What she was doing was she was praying and she was studying the Bible. She was studying science and health with key to the scriptures. She was also receiving the help of a Christian science practitioner. Together, they were striving to see her innate wholeness and wellness, that health that she would always have, because she is the child, the child of God, the very daughter of infinite love itself. Her husband, the very dearest of men, practically begged her to have the operation. So she decided to go ahead with it. But this time, the doctors didn't find one single tumor. In fact, their words to her were, you're clean as a baby. This healing happened in 1984. My friend today is very active in her church. She has a very active family life and a wonderful circle of friends. You can hardly imagine her gratitude. To think this way, perfect God, perfect man, each of us perfect as the reflection of God, can require a certain inner discipline to think this way all the time. Perhaps you have a neighbor who simply gets mad at you for no reason. Uh, and I think it requires a certain inner discipline not to simply react, but to maintain this idea of God's perfection, of, of the perfection of each of his children. Uh, it requires a certain inner discipline to turn to God in prayer, to see this neighbor in the light of God's own perfection, and to see if there's some step that might be taken to reconcile with the neighbor. Or perhaps you have a family member who for the last few decades has had a behavior that's been so problematical for the rest of the family. It requires perhaps a certain inner discipline to continue to love this person, to continue to support this person as they reform and as they stop this behavior that's so problematical. So I can't tell you that thinking this way is always easy. But what I can tell you is thinking this way is very rewarding because over and over again, I've seen thinking like this bring healing to families and to neighborhoods. I think that thinking this way in the midst of a pandemic can require a certain inner discipline. And we might even ask ourselves if thinking this way in the midst of a pandemic is responsible. The answer to that question is yes. It's that Christian science isn't practiced in isolation, but Christian science teaches that we're to put our arms around the whole world in prayer and to be uplifted along with the whole world. Christian science teaches an appreciation of everything good humanly. That certainly includes an appreciation of the nurse who spends long hours at the hospital caring for others. That certainly includes an appreciation of the politician who's able to communicate necessary information, but in a way that actually encourages the population. That includes an appreciation of fellow citizens who are respecting requests of public authorities, for example, to, to practice physical distancing. I've seen this way of thinking provide protection. I've traveled to some 33 or 34 countries around the world, in many cases to countries where the level of public sanitation is not that high. I think I've been to Brazil six or seven times, Brazil where dengue fever is almost always a problem. Uh, I can remember being in Beda, Mozambique some years ago when the city was being very challenged by malaria. But when I've gone to these places, it hasn't been with my eyes closed, it's been with my eyes open 
to see the protecting power of this infinite love. I travel to these places with my heart open to express that love. And to at least some degree, I've seen as one's thought is just filled with this love, there's no space in your thought left over for fear or even for images of disease. And in a sense, one becomes kind of like a law unto oneself of protection as one's heart is just filled with love and with nothing else. Earlier this year, I was giving lectures in three countries in Africa, and I had just finished giving a talk in Nigeria, and my throat had become quite sore. I asked a friend who was a Christian scientist to pray for me. This was a Sunday. Late that night, I received an instant message from a family member in Canada saying that the Canadian government was asking that all Canadians come back home as soon as possible while there were still commercial airlines in operation. I prayed about it through the night and decided to do my best to come back to Ottawa, Canada as quickly as I could. My throat was still sore. So I asked my friend to continue to pray with me. Perhaps a little bit like the situation for many people in South Carolina, perhaps a little bit like the situation for many people around the world at this moment, the physical circumstances were very uncertain for me at that moment. Would I be able to find a ticket that would take me from Lagos, Nigeria to Ottawa, Canada? Would I be well enough to travel or would I have to spend weeks or months far from home in a hotel room? I wanted to travel, I wanted to be well, but even more importantly, I wanted to practice the golden rule. That's Jesus' teachings to do unto others as you would have them do unto us. And if one is sick with a contagious disease and if that's uh, necessary, if it's necessary in order to protect others, to communicate that information. That's the ethical thing to do. That's the practical ethics of Jesus. That's the practical ethics of Christian science. So if it were necessary, I certainly would have communicated that information. I prayed, and I prayed essentially with two ideas. First, that everything I get, I get directly and exclusively from my source, just like every ray of light from the sun gets everything directly and exclusively from the sun, not from the other rays. And of course, I could only get good from God, even as in truth, everybody can only get good from God. The second idea with which I prayed was that my home wasn't a geographical location. It wasn't a set of familiar material surroundings. My home was the consciousness of the allness of this love. And I knew that I had that consciousness, that therefore I was at home. And in some way, I knew I could prove that. I began to call the airlines to try and figure out a ticket, but getting through the airlines in mid-March was almost impossible. So I looked online after prayer and a lot of work, I found a, an itinerary that would take me uh, to five different cities through four countries, it would have me leaving the next morning. But it seemed realistic. So I purchased the ticket. I spent the rest of that day, the rest of that Monday, praying for myself and praying for the world. I woke up Tuesday morning feeling perfectly fine. I thanked my friend for his work. I left the hotel that morning at about 9 a.m. I meticulously obeyed the letter and the spirit of all of the requirements that the airlines had, that the, that the airports had, including going through the thermal scanner in Accra, Ghana. I returned very late at night Wednesday. In other words, it was essentially two consecutive days of travel. I returned at home very late Wednesday, but with a, a singing heart. And of course, I self-isolated for two weeks, as was requested by uh, the Canadian government of those coming to Canada from abroad. I wanted to recount that experience so that you would have confidence wherever this pandemic finds you, confidence that you can pray effectively for yourself, for your family, and for the broader world. Praying this way will guide you 
to be respectful towards others. It will guide you to express love and consideration towards others. Praying this way will also bring healing to you if that's the need that you have, if that's the need that your family has. Sometimes thinking this way can almost change the character of the person. That was the experience of a friend of mine who learned of Christian science when he was a teenager. My friend came from a low income family and he hardly knew his father. In fact, one of my friend's favorite activities was going out and drinking with his buddies. But he had a neighbor who was a member of the Christian Science Church. And this man was a quiet man. He was obviously a man of integrity. Uh, he certainly had a lot of confidence in God. This neighbor invited my friend to go with him to church. And because in Christian Science churches around the world, there's Sunday school for young people up to age 20, in effect, it was an invitation to go to Sunday school at his church. My friend thought about it and accepted the invitation. And what he heard in that Christian Science Sunday School had a great impact on him because he heard for the very first time that he has one perfect father-mother love, one perfect father-mother God, and that he's a perfect son of this perfect father-mother God. He loved that idea. He loved that idea so much that he started attending that Sunday school regularly. And step by step, the ideas that he was hearing in this Christian Science Sunday School were having an effect on him. They were changing the way he was thinking of himself. There were many changes. One of the changes was he really liked his friends, but he decided he really didn't need to drink anymore. He didn't want to drink anymore. So he stopped drinking. And then a way opened up for him to be able to attend university. This was surprising because, as I said, he came from a low-income family. And this was in the United States where university usually costs a lot of money. He applied. He was accepted. At university, he worked very hard on his studies but I believe he worked even harder on himself. He wanted to express so much love towards um, his fellow students, so much love towards the professors and, and towards everybody. Well, fast forwarding some 10 years, my friend graduated. He has a job he loves. He's very active in his community. He and his wife have a little boy. I think what impresses me so much in this case is that, it, no, it wasn't just that, yes, he went to university and now has a job he loves. It was that this idea of God as being infinite, unopposed love, one father, mother love, has enriched his life so much. And now he, through the way he's living, is enriching the lives of others. Really, his life has a spiritual and moral orientation that it never had before. I can hardly think of my friend without thinking of the Ten Commandments. We probably all know the Ten Commandments a little bit. Maybe we've seen images of Moses with the two tablets. Of course, we can find the Ten Commandments in the Bible book of Exodus. The Ten Commandments were very important in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, and he references them often. The Ten Commandments have been very important in the evolution of humanity. The very first commandment to have no gods other than me. To me, that means to recognize that we truly recognize the infinitude of this love and live in harmony with this love. The next commandment to have no uh, to have no uh, graven images, and often we would think of a graven image as being a, a statue that a person might worship. But sometimes graven images are purely mental. During this time of uh, this pandemic. Many of us are having to learn new technologies. An image of ourselves as being not very good with technology, that's a, a graven image that we need not worship. Uh, the next commandment, to not take the name of God in vain, that certainly means to not swear. But I love to think of it as meaning to not take the nature of God in vain. But again, to recognize the infinitude of love. The next commandment to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. I love to 
go to church on Sunday. But I also love to think of my own holiness every day of the week, to think the whole, of the holiness of everybody around me every day of the week. The next commandment, to honor thy father and thy mother. I think it just makes good sense to honor everything in our human parents, even as we honor everything good in everyone around us. The next commandment, to not kill, obviously important, literally. But sometimes people are uh, kind of like a, like a killed joy. Uh, perhaps they entertain a, a limited concept of another person, for example. The next commandment, to not commit adultery. That means to definitely be faithful within one's marriage. It means to always have pure and clean thoughts. I love to think of it as always being a person who's dependable and reliable, who say, does what he says he's going to do, for example. The next commandment, to not steal. As one's eyes are open to this reality of infinite God, there's no need to steal. The next commandment, to not bear false witness. That means to always tell the truth. In Christian science, it's very important to be a person of integrity, a person of substance. Truth is a synonym of God in Christian science. So it's very important that we be honest all the time. The last commandment, to not covet, means, again, to see the good that one has as the very reflection of this infinite, unopposed love. I mentioned that the Ten Commandments have been very important in the evolution of humanity. And I think that one of the reasons for that is that, in, in a sense, the Ten Commandments define identity. So, for example, the daughter of God has no limited sense of her capacities, has no limiting self-image. Rather, she sees that she can do everything that God requires of her to do for the glory of God. Or the Son of God has no desire to steal because his eyes are open to the reality that we have infinite good as the very expressions of this infinite love. I'm persuaded that the little boy who's seven years old wants to tell the truth because it's his very nature. So the Ten Commandments never judge us. The Ten Commandments never condemn us. The Ten Commandments always support us in the demonstration of our actual spiritual nature as reflections of this infinite unopposed love. I mentioned that the child of God always has everything that he or she needs. That was the experience of a friend of mine who had moved clear across the country to accept a job, moved with his wife and two small children. But after two or three years, because of organizational changes, the job disappeared. So my friend didn't have a job. What he did have was a wife, two small children, and a mortgage. Maybe his situation was a little bit like the situation of some people in Anderson, many people in South Carolina, or many people in the world who honestly don't know how things are going to be working out for them financially. My friend prayed, but he didn't start his prayers with fear or with what he didn't have. He started his prayers with God, just like the Lord's Prayer starts with our Father. He thought of God and how much God loved him. And he thought of just how much God loved his wife and his two precious children. And then he had a wonderful thought. The thought occurred to him that it would actually be impossible for God not to meet their needs because of just how great God's love was for each of them. He didn't know how things would work out financially, but he was confident that they would. Not long after that, he was offered a job. This job was going to require that he develop new skills, but he was confident he could do the job. He prayed about it. He accepted it. Now, some six years later, he's done very well at the job. The organization has been greatly blessed. His family has been greatly blessed. The whole experience confirmed for him that infinite love would always be there for him and his family. 
the whole experience confirmed for him that infinite love would always be there for everybody and for everybody's family to meet everyone's needs. You might ask yourself, does Christian science always heal? That's a good question. Christian science was discovered in 1866, and since then, those applying this science have faced essentially the same challenges as the rest of humanity, including the same health challenges. Sometimes they've been healed immediately, sometimes they haven't. But the overall record of Christian science healing is a very strong record indeed. Mary Baker Eddy went on to found the Church of Christ Scientist that has branches in many countries around the world. She served as the pastor of the church, as the pastor emeritus. She also went on to found a series of magazines, uh, the Christian Science Journal, which is published monthly, the Herald of Christian Science, also a monthly publication, the Christian Science Sentinel, which is a weekly publication. In each of these publications, in each and every issue, since well more than a century now, have always been published um, verified testimonies of healing. Up until now, some 65,000 of them. Healings of everything from cancers to AIDS, uh, healings of blindness, of Alzheimer's, healing of eating disorders, healing of, um, of uh, broken bones, healing of addiction, something that's so important in this time of the opioid crisis. When you read these testimonies, it feels a little bit like reading the, the gospels that are just filled with the healings that were affected by Jesus and uh, by his disciples. Not only that, in Christian science churches around the world, there are Wednesday testimony meetings. And at these meetings, people tell of how they've been healed through applying the teachings of Christian science, how they've helped bring healing to others as well. In many cases, human thought is at that ground floor level or on the second floor. But healing always happens to the degree we realize our purely spiritual nature and the joy and the privilege and sometimes the work of realizing who we truly are as spiritual sons and daughters of God. Well, that's the joy and that's the privilege of following the perfect example of Jesus, the perfect example of the master. Up until now, all of the healings that I've recounted have been healings of the individual or their families. But I wanted to give you an example of how to pray for the collectivity. This can be for your city, for its economic rejuvenation. Uh, this can be for world problem like uh, racism or global climate change. This was the experience of a friend of mine who lived in a developing country. He accepted a job as the financial controller of a large, um, uh, of, of a large uh, government institution, a government institution that employed more than 1,400 people. But after about two or three months, he came to realize that employee theft was an enormous problem. This corruption was taking several forms. First, people were manipulating the computer system with the aid of, uh, with the complicity of the cashiers in order to rob the organization. There was the issuing of false receipts, even the outright theft of equipment from the premises. My friend wanted the organization to truly be serving its clients. He wanted it to be a strong example of transparency. He wanted the accounting to be in conformity with national and international norms. He took several steps. First, he modernized the accounting system. He improved the inventory system. He set up a sort of internal auditing system and he worked to increase employee salaries. But most especially, he prayed. He prayed that his eyes would be open to see the honesty and the integrity of each and every one of his fellow employees. His efforts to reform the organization were met with stiff resistance. That resistance took several forms. First, 
there was a group of employees that wrote a false report about my friend and sent that report to his immediate superior and to the minister of finance in his country. All of the allegations were investigated. None of them were true. My friend kept on praying. And then a colleague of his said that he had inadvertently overheard a conversation between two other employees. And these employees had said that really the only way to stop this reform was to eliminate my friend using witchcraft. I think I can say that in some cultures around the world, in some countries around the world, witchcraft is a way of seeking to personally control another person. I'm not sure about South Carolina, but in Canadian work settings, we have our own ways of seeking to do that. That could be backstabbing, backbiting, campaigns of lies. Sometimes office politics can be brutal. But in his culture, it was witchcraft. My friend heard that, but he just kept right on praying. He was confident that there's nothing apart from this love and its expression. Some time after that, he was alone working in the office on a Saturday, and he suddenly felt a very sharp pain, and a part of his body seemed to be immobilized. He recognized right away that this was impersonal resistance to these reforms that were going to bless the employees, their families, the clients, everybody. Specifically, he prayed with this passage from Science and Health. It says here, your influence for good depends upon the weight you throw into the right scale. The good you do and embody gives you the only power obtainable. My friend knew that he was embodying infinite good and nothing else. And he was confident that that embodying of good was a powerful prayer. It took him a couple of days of steadfast prayer, but the pain stopped completely and he was able to move normally. By this time, uh, he just kept on praying. And by this time, the administration had assigned him a couple of security guards who were there just to protect him because he'd received some direct threats. But he was unconcerned. He was so confident that there was just this love and nothing apart from love in its expression. And that that defined, that love defined the identity of each of the employees. And then a marvelous thing happened. His colleagues at the same level as him within the organization, instead of just saying, okay, if you wanna do those reforms, you go ahead. They really began to support these reforms. And not long after that, all of the employees were supporting the reforms. The reforms. My friend knew it was the case. He could see it in the internal audits. He could see it in the books. It was a great victory for that organization in a country where corruption has often been a problem. It was a great victory for my friend. Other individuals from other managers from other government institutions came and asked my friend how they'd achieved that. I wanted to read one last passage from Science and Health. This is a strong passage on identity. Uh, and it's a passage that's read towards the end of every Christian science church service, every Christian science Sunday service. It's also the very last thing that's read in Christian science Sunday school sessions. In it, the author uses the term man to mean men and women in their eternal spiritual nature. Here's the passage. There is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation, for God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God, and man is his image and likeness. Therefore, man is not material, he is spiritual. Well, allow me to summarize. 
I gave you some background on Mary Baker Eddy, how she found in the scriptures a sense of God as being infinite, unopposed love, how she found in the scriptures a sense of identity as being the very expression of this love, how this spiritual reality comes to each of us wherever we are in human life to console us, to strengthen us. It comes to heal us. It comes to redeem us and to redeem all humanity. I wanted you to have confidence in praying, certainly about this pandemic. And my friend who reformed that corrupt institution, I don't think he ever once had a thought, oh, I'm just one person, what good will my prayers do? He was confident that the power to effect change wasn't in him personally, but in the very reality of the nature of God, the nature of God's own image and likeness. So you should have confidence as you're praying for this pandemic to, as they say, flatten the curve and to really eliminate this pandemic in one's own country and around the world. We should have confidence. If one's praying for another global problem, such as I, I think I mentioned racism earlier or global climate change. If one's praying for um, greater political unity in one's own country or in the country of another. If one's praying for greater honesty and integrity in elected officials, if you're praying for honesty and integrity in elected officials, your prayers in that direction are going to be effective to the degree that you live consistently with those prayers. It's from the authority of how we're living our lives day in and day out. That's what really makes our prayers effective. Just like it's, well, the, the dollars that you might have in your bank account that means that your check is accepted as valid. So it's the way we're living con consistently, the honesty and the integrity, for example, that makes our prayers in that direction effective for everyone. And our prayers are absolutely inseparable from the way that we live our lives. And we can have confidence as we pray for local issues like homelessness or global issues like, as I say, global climate change. I wanted to heartily recommend an in-depth study of the Bible as a way of seeing even more clearly your true spiritual nature. I wanted to heartily recommend an in-depth study of science and health with the key to the scriptures as a way of understanding even more fully the spiritual and practical meaning of the Bible. I wanted to let you know that this talk is going to be available on the website christiansciencesandersonsc.com. That's christiansciencesandersonsc.com. If you uh, want to recommend it to friends or neighbors or watch it again yourself. Special thanks to the Branch Church in Anderson, South Carolina for having sponsored this talk. And lastly, I wanted to thank each of you for your participation. I wanted to thank each of you for your kind attention. Goodbye.